Welcome to Creation Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle, and today our topic is going to be about the sanctity of human life or the abortion issue. And with us today is Randy Alcorn. Randy, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great to be with you. It's, it's a privilege to have you here. You've written a lot on this issue, haven't you? I have. I've got three different books that relate to it, and I actually mention it in a lot of my other books as well. But you, yes, I was going to talk about you've written many other novels, haven't you? What, what novels have you written? Well, let's see, I've written uh, 10 novels, uh, two that are just really kids' books. They're not full-length novels. A couple My of, kind of books. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a couple of graphic novels, which are just the long comic book style, okay. which would probably be right a up your pictures. alley. Yeah, okay, a lot great. of pictures. Um, and then probably seven or eight uh, full-length uh, novels, uh, Deadline, Dominion, Deception, Safely Home, Lord Falgren's Letters, Ishbane Conspiracy, um, others. Yeah. I think my wife has just about every one of them, and she's going to have you autograph all those. Oh, okay, that okay. that's all right. just so, great. Yeah. All right. But one of the books I like a lot we're going to be talking about today is Why Pro-Life? That seems to be a very big issue with you. Matter of fact, you have a ministry. I've got the, it's called what, EPM? What does that stand yeah, for? Yeah, Eternal Perspective Ministries. What is that ministry and how did it get started? Well, it's a ministry that uh, basically is a platform for my speaking and writing where we tie together matters of eternal perspective, trying to get uh, a view of eternity, viewing the things that are happening to us in this world, in our culture, in our personal lives, viewing them in light of eternity. Scripture says, we don't look at the things which are seen, we look at the things which are unseen. But the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal. And so we really try to get that sense of we live in a culture that tends to be very, very superficial. People don't think. And when they do think, they don't tend to think accurately. So it's getting back to God's Word as the source that directs our thinking. And that's why in, in all my books, 50-some books now, um, most of those are nonfiction, about 40 or so, um, really emphasizing God's Word. Because I, I always feel like when I'm writing a book, if I'm quoting Scripture, I can't go wrong because God says, that his word will not return unto him empty without accomplishing the purpose for which he sent it. He doesn't say that about my words, he says that about his words. Well, that brings up an interesting topic, and I know you, you covered this in your book, and I'm going to keep talking about this book because I went through this book a couple times, mm. and I've outlined many things in there that are mm. so important in this pro-life mm. issue. And one of the ones is, if a woman has had an abortion, can she really be forgiven? Mm. Absolutely. We can be forgiven uh, for anything. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I think of uh, Psalm 32 where David, who had committed really terrible sins, uh, he says, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And I've got a book called Happiness in which I developed the fact that this Hebrew word Asher uh, that is translated blessed was the common Hebrew word for happy. It, it meant happy, a happiness from God. So happy is the one, and there are translations that um, reflect that, happy is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. And then he says this, and this applies to any woman who's had an abortion, any man that's been behind an abortion, because many men have pressured their girlfriends or their wives into getting abortions, and they stand guilty before God, but they don't have to remain guilty because of the redemptive work of Christ on our behalf. David says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Day and night, your hand, God, was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as in the heat of summer. But then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So then he goes on to talk about the gladness and the happiness that comes when we're truly forgiven by God. Wow. 
What a great message to women out there, and like I say, to the men also, that we really can stand before God forgiven. In other words, you're kind of saying God's mm -hmm. mercy and grace is big enough to cover anything we've done. That's right. Um, one of my more recent books is a book just called Grace, and I have another one called The Grace and Truth Paradox. Grace is central to the gospel, and uh, every one of us needs it. And, and this is why um, when I talk with women who've had abortions, and they feel such horrible guilt. And where are the people from the abortion clinics at those times? They're never to be found. They just took their money, killed their baby, told them everything would be fine, and then this woman, decades later, is just in agony, sometimes having suicidal thoughts, sometimes just coming to grips the, the, with the fact every year on the day uh, the anniversary of the abortion. They remember that day. They're struggling, and uh, sometimes they've gotten into addictions as a result of it to try to get away from the horrors that they feel because they killed their child. But then we've got to understand that God fully forgives. And look at the history of the Christian church. Paul was a murderer. He was a killer of people. Not only did he consent to the killing of Stephen, it says he went door to door, hauling people from their homes. He, he was guilty of the sin of murder. He said, um, sinners of whom I am chief. I am the chief of all sinners. And he was instrumental in the early missions and spread of the gospel and the Christian church. God not only forgives, he uses greatly people who have had abortions, confessed them. Uh, we took a girl into our home uh, many years ago when she was 18 years old and she'd had a couple of abortions and she was pregnant again. We helped her place her child uh, for adoption. I had the privilege, my wife and I had the privilege of being there for a reunion with that son a couple years ago, just 33 years later. And just a very beautiful thing, this Christian family into which he was adopted. But God has used our friend Diane to do incredible things. She, she goes in and leads post-abortion Bible studies for women who are in prison uh, and gets the gospel to them. Uh, they come to faith in Christ. Those who are believers experience a newness of forgiveness and also a motivation now to share their story and to help other women who have suffered like they have suffered. Now, when talking about abortion, isn't that mostly non-believers having abortions? Are Christians having abortions? Well, uh, many, many Christians do uh, have abortions, depending on what studies that you look at. Somewhere in the neighborhood of one of, out of every five women uh, getting an abortion claims to be an evangelical Christian. Wow. Now, sometimes that doesn't mean that they're really regularly going to church. Other times they are regularly going to church, but that's at least how they identify. And then you have, despite the pro-life stand of uh, the Catholic Church, you have a number of Catholics who, uh, professing Catholics at least, who end up getting abortions as well. So we really do need to understand that the people in our churches, so often we think this is the secular world. And so, we, in fact, I've had people tell me, we don't need to, everybody knows this stuff at church. So we don't need to talk about it at church. So forget the sanctity of human life weekend. And, and, and you don't have to bring that into a message. We're believers here. We know abortion is wrong. Well, the fact is that many young women from our church, from any church, have gotten will get and are getting, they may have an appointment this week, to get an abortion. It's, it's a problem at home. It's not just out there. Okay. So is that largely due, you think, to a lack of teaching within the churches and a lack of teaching in the homes? Yes, I think it's a lack of teaching and it's a lack of courage. Um, lack of courage to do the teaching. Um, We've had at our church where we, every year in the Sanctity of Life Sunday, we talk about not only abortion, we also talk about other uh, Sanctity of Life issues, but certainly abortion is a, a central one, given all the casualties from abortion. And we've had people say, well, you know what, I marked that weekend uh, on the calendar in advance so that I know not to come. And when I've heard that, I've said, you just really need to rethink some things. Um, 
there's tough things being said from God's Word every week, if it's a good church, because God's Word is full of tough things. Things that bring us to the end of ourselves, that remind us that we need Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. I can't pick up this book, which I do every day, and read it and meditate on it without in some way getting offended. You know, in other words, I wouldn't have come up with that, but God is telling me, Randy, you need to straighten up this area of your life. There are things you need to work on. You need to deal with this. You need to deal with that. And sometimes it's very unpleasant, but what's more unpleasant is to ignore it. Because when we ignore it, we do not experience the peace, the contentment, the happiness, the fruit of the Spirit that there is in Christ. So the people who turn away from this issue of abortion, often they do it precisely because they've had abortions, they persuaded somebody to get an abortion, they drove their daughter to uh, an abortion clinic, uh, a dad who uh, paid for her daughter to get an abortion knowing that's what she was going to do and then that way she wouldn't mess up her college scholarships for athletics or or whatever it is we need to pay attention to the prophetic message of God's word and every time we do so we're better off and we're happier as a result because I believe it says in 2 Timothy all scripture is God breathed and it's all good for teaching and doctrine so that we can be thoroughly equipped absolutely that's the very first verse to the very last verse mm -hmm. that's true now I've, I've got a question for you here Randy Planned Parenthood, I've heard him say this, and how do, we, how do we respond to this statement, that every child should be a wanted child? Well, when I hear that statement or I see that bumper sticker, every child a wanted child, I think that is a marvelous slogan. Uh, Satan is very eloquent, and the way that he operates is he lies. And when he lies, the most effective lies are the lies that sound the most true. That's, that's how a deceptive, manipulative person operates. And Jesus said in John 8, where he said, the truth will set you free. He said, Satan's a liar from the beginning. And when he lies, the NIV translates it this way, when he lies, he speaks his native language. He's very good at speaking it. So every child a wanted child. Well, I respond to that by saying, in and of itself, that expression is not a lie. It's how Planned Parenthood takes it and applies it that is the lie. And it sounds really good to say, every child I want a child. And so my response is, I totally agree. Every child should be a wanted child, so let's learn to want children more, and let's do all we can to get them into homes where they are wanted. That is the pro-life position. And then I look at my friends, acquaintances from Planned Parenthood and other pro-abortion, quote, pro-choice people, and I say, what do you mean by every child a wanted child? And often they don't really know what they mean, and so they sort of stumble their way through it, and they say, well, children should be wanted, and therefore, therefore what? Well, therefore, if the child's not wanted, it's better off to abort that child. So then I say, okay, so what you really mean by every child a wanted child is let's identify those who aren't wanted and kill them before they're born. And then they kind of look at me like, well, that, I wouldn't have said it that way. And then I say, so really what your slogan on the bumper sticker should be is not every child a wanted child, but it should be every unwanted child a dead child. Uh, that obviously would not be a good bumper sticker, and so it's not Planned Parenthood slogan. But what we've got to do is dissect, we've got to cut through the haze and say, this sounds good, but what is really meant by it? Excellent. Now, here, here's another challenge that comes up. Uh, when Do we really know when human life begins? Because I know in the scope of one of the famous trials of the Roe Weaver Wade, they didn't. They came out and said, "We don't know when human life begins." Could you tell us? Uh, do we know, really know this answer? It's interesting because I've compiled and and I have it in Why Pro Life, as well as my uh, larger book, Pro Life Answers to Pro Choice Arguments, dozens and dozens and dozens of secular scientists 
who say definitively each human life begins at conception. It is not a vague uh, notion. It, 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 it is black and white because it's at the moment of conception that you have uh, sperm from the man and an egg from the woman that come together and all they are is they each have 23 chromosomes that they're going to contribute to the joining but all they are is part of someone's body the issue of someone's body with the same DNA as that person's body, but the moment that they actually join something, I think from a Christian worldview, you would say it's just plain miraculous. And even people who don't have a Christian worldview will often use that term. It's miraculous what happens. Because now you have, for the first time, the interweaving, the joining of these 23 chromosomes from one and 23 chromosomes from the other, and these 46 chromosomes have a DNA which has never before existed in human history and has such great information that it would take a thousand volumes on a shelf to contain, if it was all printed out, the information that's there. Nobody like this. This is not simply a clone of mom or dad. This is an absolutely new person. So just before conception, no person. At conception, new person. All that happens now is growth, nutrition, time passes. So the person gets larger and larger and larger and starts developing. And by 21 days, uh, a heart is beating, circulatory system is working. Uh, by 40 days uh, after conception, uh, there are measurable brain waves. So every single uh, surgical abortion in America and throughout the world, without exception, because there's no abortions that are taking place before 40 days, no surgical abortions, abortions. Every single one of those surgical abortions stops a beating heart and stops measurable brain waves. That is just, that's just scientific fact. Well, I've, I've heard some people say, though, that human life really doesn't begin until what they call implantation. How would, you, how would we argue against that? Well, implantation is something that takes place after conception. And when you're talking about implantation, you're talking about the conceived person, sometimes called a zygote, but it's a person, uh, with that unique DNA is implanted into the, the mother's endometrium. And the endometrium provides a place and nourishment for the child. So when somebody says life begins at implantation, uh, it, it would be like saying if I take a homeless person uh, into my house and I give them a place to stay, a place to live, and I give them food or nutrition now, I have turned that individual into a person. Well, no, they were already a person. I'm giving them a place to stay and food to eat. That's what happens at implantation, a place to stay and food to eat. The person already exists, and it takes that person to be implanted and, and in some senses to implant themselves into the woman's endometrium. So that, that, that's a very, it would be very convenient because one of the reasons people want to believe that life begins at implantation is because one of the things that even birth control pills can do, uh, one of the mechanisms by which they work, there's several, uh, but is to uh, prevent implantation and nobody wants to believe that the birth control pill can cause abortions but I've got a book on that as well uh, does the birth control pill cause abortions and the answer is not always and not even usually but very clearly the answer is sometimes it does and that's why I think Christians who are truly pro-life should find uh, other means of contraceptive, if they're going to use contraceptives, 
other than the birth control pill. Okay. So what you're saying there is at conception, we get all the information we'll ever have for continued growth and nothing new is added, no new information is added after that. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's all there. And the only thing that even is going to affect things such as appearance, like the color of your eyes, it's absolutely set. Uh, different aspects, the color of your skin, different aspects of your being, it's already, it's written in stone. Uh, the only thing that we can affect are, are things like uh, what kind of food that we eat that's going to affect our weight or what kind of things we do that can affect our body. But in terms of, it's all built into us at that moment of conception. How about those foods that affect our taste buds? Yes. <laughs> we don't tend to like. <laughs> yes, yeah. right. And all of those that we yeah. really, really like happen to be. Like the chocolate. Ones, <laughs> yeah. The ones that, uh, that tend to yeah. maybe not be the best for us. Well, let me ask you one more tough question here because we're getting close on time. Yeah. This, this is a very common question. The child is part of the woman's body. Therefore, she has the right to do whatever she wants mm. with her own body. Mm. Well, uh, I understand the logic behind it, but it's based on completely poor science. Because the fact is an unborn child is not part of the woman's body, and that's easily proven. For instance, if you took her liver, well, that is a part of her body. Her hand is a part of her body. So that, that's what we mean. And, and what what is true of her hand and what's true of the liver? It's not just their location. It's the fact that they are her DNA. Start to finish, they are a part of her body. But the unborn child has its own unique DNA. And it doesn't have her DNA. It has a merging of hers and the father's, but it's more than that into this brand new creation with its own DNA, and therefore is not part of the body. And I think a, a real easy way to look at it and understand this is that if you're saying that that baby is really a part of the woman's body, then you're saying that woman's body has four eyes, uh, it has four ears, um, two noses, two mouths, and half the time that body, that woman's body also has not only her own female organs, but has male organs. In that half the time being when the child is male. Well, then we see how ludicrous it is to say that that's part of her body. No, that's a human being residing inside her body which is very, very different than that human being being part of her body. And that's obviously true at the moment that the child is born or even that there is a miscarriage. Um, and even if uh, the child is born prematurely, once that child is out there, you see this child all along had his or her own body. That own body was never part of the mother's body. It was simply located there. Wow. Well, this is great information. Um, and all this information, a lot of this information is in your book, Why Pro-Life? All the answers and how to answer questions from the abortions in this. How would they get a hold of you, Randy, if they wanted to have you come speak or they wanted to get a hold of this book or some of your other books? How would they do that? The best way to do it would be to go to our website, Eternal Eternal Perspective Ministries, and that website is epm.org. And if you go to www.epm.org, uh, you'll also, there are links to our store. Um, the book is quite inexpensive. I think we sell it for $3, and you can maybe get it in bookstores and other places for uh, $6.99 or $7 or something like that. Uh, we sell them by the case in large quantities. We give really substantial discounts. And anybody that wants them, we, we encourage people to give them away to their churches on Sanctity of Human Life weekend and other times. And to use them for training. I've done uh, over the years a lot of training related to how do we respond uh, to pro-life arguments, or rather pro-choice arguments, with pro-life answers that really make sense to people. And by the way, and you know this because you do a lot of this, um, there are many arguments we can use that are not just quotes from the Bible. 
You and I believe in the authority of Scripture. But I've talked with atheists who have become persuaded to a pro-life position just based on the scientific evidence alone. Right. So I'm going, to, I'm going to issue a challenge out there before we wrap this up. Every church out there, every church out there should get this book, Why Pro-Life, for your youth leaders and make sure they read this and start teaching it to their youth. So I'm going to issue that challenge that everyone gets this and we can stop some of this abortion happening within the churches today. I had to do that commercial. I love this book. It's so well organized. Thank you. So again, Randy Alcorn, if you want to get a hold of him, go to his website and that is again www.epm.org. And I want to thank all of you for listening to this show. Again, I'm Mike Grill, your host, and you can get a hold of us if you want to by emailing us at info, that's I-N-F-O at creationtraining.org. Thank you, and God bless all of you. Our online videos are free for anyone to view or download. However, it does take finances to continue producing these programs. If these lessons have been helpful, you might consider supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can mail a check to CTI, Post Office Box 2415, Eagle, Idaho 83616. Or you can go to our website, creationtraining.org, and make your donations that way. Your donations of $20, $100 or more will enable us to continue to share the good news of God's Word worldwide. As it states in Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Thank you and God bless.